the regular broadcast of the Minneapolis Zoning Board and of Adjustment for February 3rd, 2022 will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this live broadcast of our virtual meeting today, February 3rd, 2022. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Matt Perry and I'm chair of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so that we may verify the presence of quorum. Board Member Finlayson. Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Wonderful, thank you. Board Member Frias. Here. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johannesson. Aye. Joe Perry. Here. Board Member Sandberg. Here. Vice Chair Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Here. Board Member Wang. Here. That's nine members present. Thank you. Let the record show that we have quorum and with that we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system available at LIMS, L -I -M -S, dot Minneapolis MN dot gov. Is there a motion to approve this agenda? So move, Ben Wilson. Is there a second? Second. second. So, softly. Johannesson. <laughs> softly. It's moved and seconded. Is there any uh, discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Board Member Frias. Aye. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johannesson. Aye. Chair Perry. Aye. Board Member Sandberg. Aye. Vice Chair Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Aye. Board Member Wang. Aye. That's nine yeas and zero nays. So that motion passes and we have an approved agenda. I believe all the board members have seen a copy of the minutes from the January 20th, 2022 Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Ben Wilson. Is there a second? Second, softly. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? And if you weren't at the meeting uh, last time, please indicate by saying abstain. Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Board Member Frias. Aye. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Member Johannesson. Aye. Chair Perry. Aye. Board Member Sandberg. Abstain. Vice Chair Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Abstain. Board Member Wang. Aye. That's seven yeas and two abstentions. And that motion passes, so the minutes from the Zoning Board of Adjustment January 20th, 2022 meeting are approved. Mr. Ellis, are there any petitions or communications? Chair Perry, members of the board, uh, one communication this evening, the February 17th meeting of the Board of Adjustment will be canceled or is in the process of being canceled. We have no items for that agenda. Um, so the next regular hearing will be March 3rd. Thank you. So let's move on. Let's review the agenda. I will read the agenda number and address of the project and state whether it's slated for consent, continuance, withdrawal, return, or discussion. And I'll just talk a little bit about what consent and discussion items are. Consent items are those items that will be passed without discussion by the board. We'll be adhering to the staff's 
recommendation found on the agenda under the items recommended motion section. Any applicable conditions will be listed in the same section. If you agree with this recommendation, including any applicable conditions, you need to do nothing and the board will pass it as recommended. Please check in with the staff member assigned to that item if you have, if you have any questions following the decision. If you disagree with the recommendation, please indicate you'd like to speak against that item when I ask and we'll pull it and put it on the discussion agenda. Discussion items. These are items which the board will take public testimony, deliberate on and make a decision. After the public testimony has been heard for each particular discussion item, I will close the public hearing for that agenda item. Once I close the public hearing for an item, no additional public testimony will be taken, but staff may be asked questions by board members. After the public hearing for an item is closed, board members will then discuss and act on motions and the chair only votes in the case of a tie. So let's look at the recommended dispositions of the agenda of the land use requests items on our agenda today. Agenda item number five is 1719 49th Street East. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against this item? And if you do want to speak against the item, please press star sticks on your phone to unmute yourself. And you might have to unmute your device as well and simply say you'd like to have the item heard. Again, that's agenda item number five, 1719 49th Street East. Agenda item number six is 1305 7th Avenue Southeast. This item is being withdrawn. Adoption of the agenda acknowledges this and no further action is required by the board. Um, staff maybe uh, uh, want to give us a little bit of a background on this. Ms. Thank Brandt. you, Chair Perry, members of the board. Um, earlier this afternoon, the appellant indicated um, that he intended to withdraw the application um, and will be filing a similar uh, appeal on a forthcoming project in the future. Thank you very much. Agenda item number seven is 1400 Gerard Avenue North. This is a discussion item. Agenda number number eight is 2115 East Lake of the Isles Parkway. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? I'm hearing no one. Agenda item number nine is 3030 Nicollet Avenue. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Hi. Yes. Um, my name is Angelina McDowell. I, I I was trying to make sure I, I understand this. Uh, are you asking for someone to speak on 1400 Gerard Avenue North? Not yet. We're gonna we're gonna have a pub, the staff do a uh, presentation and then we'll have people speak to that item. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I'll put nope. myself back on mute again. No problem. So as I was saying, 3030 Nicollet Avenue, um, staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? Uh, Chair Perry, this is Sandberg. Uh, based on one of the um, submitted written comments, I think uh, it's worth hearing some staff explanation of this item. So you wanna pull it? Um, yes. Okay, so we'll pull item number nine. Agenda item number 10 is 3118 Stevens Avenue. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? I'm hearing no one. So let's review the items on the agenda for consent. They are five, eight, and 10. Is there a motion to adopt these items on consent? So moved, Ben Wilson. Second Sandberg. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board member Finlayson. Aye. Board member Frias. Aye. Board member Hutchins. Aye. Board member Johannesson. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. 
Board Member Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Aye. Board Member Wang. Aye. Eight yeas and zero nays. So that motion passes. And if you are here for agenda items five, eight, or 10, congratulations. Your land use requests are approved. Good luck with your projects. Let's move on to agenda item number seven, 1400 Gerard Avenue North, Ms. Dawkins. Chair Perry. Yes, Board sir. Member, Board member Finlayson, I need to recuse myself in this item. I have appraised the property for a fee. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Perry and members of the board. Plan 13887 is an application for proposed variances located at 1400 Gerard Avenue North. Next slide, please. The subject site is a 7,280 square foot residential lot. There is an existing duplex on the site that recently went through extensive interior and exterior renovations. The subject site is located in the R2B multiple family zoning district and is in the interior two built form overlay district. The site is bounded on the west by Gerard Avenue North and to the south by 14th Avenue North. The surrounding area is composed of single and multiple family structures. Next slide, please. During the course of the renovations on the property, a retaining wall was constructed along the exterior property lines of the site. There's also, it goes partially into the interior of the site as well. The retaining wall is within the right of way along Gerard Avenue and along 14th Avenue adjacent to the public sidewalk. The applicant did not ob obtain a building permit for the construction of the retaining wall as it is under four feet in height and generally retaining walls that are retaining natural grade and are under four feet in height do not require a building permit. In addition to building the retaining wall, the applicant also added a concrete patio in the required front yard that is over 50 square feet in size. The applicant is requesting two variances in order to allow the retaining wall to remain in its current location and to allow the patio to remain. The specific variances being requested are to allow a retaining wall that is not retaining natural grade within the front and corner side yard setbacks and to allow a patio that is larger than 50 feet within the required front yard. Uh, next slide, please. These are some photos of the site. Uh, the top two photos are before and after pictures provided by the applicant. So you can see on the left is the structure before the um, addition of the retaining wall and, and significant alterations to the exterior. Um, and then on the right is the finished duplex. The uh, the photo in the left right hand, le lower left hand corner is the is a photo of during the construction of the retaining wall. So you can see where they cut into the um, into the yard there or into it, what is technically the right of the right of way adjacent to the public sidewalk. Uh, the photos in the lower right hand corner are provided by the city zoning inspector showing the finished wall before the yard was backfilled to level out the yard to the height of the new retaining wall. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'm going to go through both uh, both variance requests in in some detail. So just bear with me. For the variance to permit a retaining wall that does not retain natural grade, staff found that practical difficulties do not exist in complying with the ordinance. The site is relatively flat at the top of a three approximately three foot slight slope from the sidewalk grade. The lot is a standard size and shape, and the structural integrity of the home is not was not threatened by the slope of the site. The retaining wall was placed at the edge of the existing yard within the right of way and at that location, the natural grade of this slope did not require a wall that was over three feet in height in most places to retain the natural grade. Additionally, the applicant had the option to cut into the slope and place the retaining wall further back so that it was actually retaining the natural grade and outside of the public right of way. Staff found that the retaining wall um, that the retaining wall is not in a, uh, a use is not a use of the property that is reasonable. The wall is not retaining natural grade and is within the right of way, creating a conflict with the sidewalk. 
the applicant had an alternative that would have met code and the wall was constructed that was constructed as not in keeping with the intent of the ordinance. Staff did find that the retaining wall does not alter the essential character of the locality. There are similar walls adjacent to the property and within the neighborhood. The retaining wall itself does limit erosion from the slope of the yard and limits the rock and dirt from degrading into the public right of way. Uh, so staff determined that the retaining wall variants would not be detrimental to users of the property or the general public. So staff found that finding three was met for the retaining wall request. Next slide, please. For the variance allowing a patio over 50 square feet within the retain within the required front yard, uh, the staff found that none of the findings were met. The patio is oversized and not necessary to the enjoyment of the property, and there is nothing about the property that requires a larger front yard patio as there is ample space in the rear yard for recreation. There is no functional reason to allow a larger patio in the front yard. Additionally, the intent of limiting the size of patios uh, is to limit impacts on neighboring properties and allowing this patio to remain would increase the impact on neighboring properties and to the general public. Next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, given that staff found several findings not to be met, staff is re recommending denial of both variance requests. During the notification period, we received um, a, several neighborhood comments in support um, for, comments of support for the variances from neighbors and those comments should have been provided to the board prior to the meeting. Uh, this concludes the staff pres presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Dawkins. Are there any questions of staff? Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Thanks, Ms. Dawkins. Uh, one of the questions I had of Ms. Dawkins, uh, you said that the photos were before and after that we were shown were mm -hmm. from city inspectors. So they were present when the old retaining wall was removed and no. saw them laying out the new one and didn't say, hey. Um, can, can we go back to the photo slide? So the before and after photos were provided by the applicant, the, the, the photos at the top and the photo of the construction of, uh, of the construction of the retaining wall that was also provided by the applicant. The inspector photos were taken because a code compliance um, uh, issue, a code compliance, a code enforcement case was opened up during inspections of other parts of the property. There was also an issue with interior kitchens um, at the same time. So when the zoning enforcement inspector was out there, they also um, noted that the retaining wall was not retaining natural grade and that the patio was over an oversized obstruction in the front yard. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks for that clarification. Sure. Any other questions of staff? I don't hear any, so let's uh, open the public hearing. And um, we have in queue, uh, let me just bring that back up. Uh, Blake Zochert, if you want to press star six to unmute yourself. Hello? Hello, yes. Could you give your name and address for the record, please? My name is Blake Zockert. My uh, primary address is 1322 Washburn Avenue North, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55411. Thank you. Would you like to give testimony? I certainly do. Great, go ahead. Uh, well, First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and uh, to listen to me here. I understand I'm supposed to keep this around 10 minutes and I will try my best to do so. It's obviously a pretty complicated issue. So if I go a little bit over, I hope you grab me some leeway there. Um, there are a couple points I wanna make and my case and my documentation will absolutely prove that natural grade it was not altered 
per min, per their own codes and their own definitions. Um, also made uh, evidence by the city. The city was asked and made aware of the plans to build the wall and a future fence on top of the wall and said absolutely nothing. They, they were made aware of the plans to build the wall. They watched the wall being built and they didn't say anything that the wall was in violation of anything. Um, there were serious issues and practical difficulties uh, at the site if you did not do the improvements and put the wall up. Uh, the prior slope made the wall impossible impossible to maintain. Uh, growing grass and ground cover, ground cover was very difficult. It created a hazard for the mature trees and other uh, shrubs and other landscaping at the property. And, and as staff said, there was a huge erosion problem by not having the wall there. Um, I'm going to provide evidence from uh, an engineering an engineering expert and a professional certified arborist that prove the need for the wall to retain the trees. Um, that the wall solves all the previous problems of the trees, uh, the erosion issues, and it and it obviously allows a allows a far more usable yard that's able to be enjoyed by the occupants of the house and easy to maintain. Um, the front patio should be allowed per code. Um, it's a functional benefit to the property in the neighborhood. It uh, encourages people to be out in front of the property and not hidden in the backyard. It creates more of a sense of community. So it, frankly, what size the patio is, I don't see what that has to do about anything more or less. Um, the wall and the patio, as staff has already said, are not uh, a hazard to the health, safety, or anyone in the area or the occupants of the house. It, uh, it keeps with the historical aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, uh, that's what I kind of want to go over. So yeah, I do want to go over a couple of things. Um, I did reach out to zoning. Uh, I did reach out to zoning specifically and asked what could and could not be built at 1400 Gerard. I told them of my plans to build a retaining wall from the front of the property, wrapping around to the side, going all the way down to the alley. And I told them I eventually wanted to put a privacy fence on top of this wall in the back. Um, I asked them, I told them my intentions, they didn't say anything about it. Uh, it wasn't until well after the wall was completed, about 10 months after, that I was told it was not allowed. And again, during that time the wall was being built, they had come out for other inspections and multiple other inspectors and other people from that department even had been out the property and saw the wall in process. It was not a surprise to them. Um, th the city says the retaining wall is not allowed in the required front yard per ordinance because it alters the grade of the site or the natural grade. By their own definitions, we did not alter the grade of the site. Um, the area around the house was not disturbed and you'll see from the professional survey that the, the grade is um, pretty much consistent throughout. Um, the wall does not exceed four feet in height, which was one of the reasons they gave initially for the wall not being uh, valid and obviously you can see by the survey that the wall in nowhere uh the wall in no area exceeds four feet in height um the city says that actually the reason they gave and the reason i saw online that the patio was not allowed in the front yard was because it was made of a impermeable substance so if the patio was a uh, wood chips or some other substance it would be completely fine but because it's concrete, th that obstruction is not allowed in the front yard. Um, I would argue that th that doesn't make any sense. And um, the reason for the ordinance I was told is so that uh, if there's a large impermeable surface in the front yard that there's runoff isn't an issue in this case because the retaining wall solves all issues of runoff. Um, so if you bear with me here, again, there's a lot of stuff I'm just trying to go over. Again, I bought the home. It was very uh, hard to maintain the house. Um, it was just dirt on the slope, so I, I, I couldn't mow the yarn, uh, the, the lawn. It was a huge erosion, erosion hazard. Uh, the trees and shrubs were starting to de deteriorate, making them unstable. Um, adding the wall has pretty much uh, ensured the trees will be saved for a longer period of time. Uh, Minneapolis states a goal of, you know, saving to and adding to the natural canopy. So I would assume they would be completely in favor of this. Um, so I'm gonna go over some of the exhibits here quickly, if I will. Um, I'm also going to say that uh, 
per the staff's own report that uh, walls like this are very common uh, throughout Minneapolis. So if you grant this, uh, it's not like you're granting anything that isn't um, very common and all, all over the city. In fact, the, there's a retaining wall exactly like this uh, at the property across the alley at 1401 Emerson. Um, excuse, pardon me while I go through my exhibits here. Um, trying to find it, lots of open windows here. Uh, so yeah, um, item marked uh, exhibit one is a simple before and after picture that I provided to staff. Um, exhibit two is a professional survey of the lot, which you've seen. Again, it's really crucial to this whole case per the staff's argument is that the natural grade of this property was not altered. Um, the area around the house was undisturbed. So whatever measurements you see in the survey, that's the natural grade. What they define as the natural grade is in the lowest area, 10 feet out from the property. Um, all those were not disturbed. Um, exhibit three, as you saw, proves that we started to build the wall in July of 2020. The city saw us working on it for months. And again, they were out looking at, uh, in the interior for you know doing other inspections or whatnot. Nothing was said, no stop work order was issued. Uh, it wasn't until 10 months after in April, 2021, that the, the you know, that they said the wall was not allowed. Um, if I may jump to exhibit um, 5A and B, uh, this is a graphic of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances definition of natural grade. You'll see that um, again, it's the flat area around uh, 10 feet around the foundation of the house. So per their own definitions, per their own codes, the, the wall does not alter the natural grade. So the pictures they showed you of the lawn being lower than the retaining wall is false. That's actually also, that's actually per their own definitions, that would be required, sorry, that would be considered the rough grade of the property, not the final grade of the property, which is when, you know, you all, which is when you add the extra soil that you, you that you'd have to have for sod and to add the dirt. So again, the pictures they showed you of the rough grade, not of the final grade. The final grade of the property did not alter the original grade of the property at all. Uh, exhibit six is a very crucial exhibit. These are my emails with the city of Minneapolis and their zoning board specifically, where I told them my plans to build the wall. Um, and they didn't say anything. So again, uh, one of your concern was that, um, you know, had they not seen this, how come they didn't stop it? Did the, they were completely aware of the situation and didn't say anything. Uh, you can tell in the emails that I, I tell them my intent to build a wall and a fence on top of it. There's, there's nothing from them that say, um, please don't build this or that it's in violation of any zoning regulations. Um, I say again, explicitly, there will be a retaining wall under four feet in the front and side yard, and we have plans to put a fence on the top of the wall. They do not say anything about it and they say, go ahead, it's totally fine. Uh, again, their last response uh, in this chain is they, they raise no objection to a retaining wall in the front or front side yard. There's not even a request for clarification about, hey, how are you doing or what's going on? Um, and there for sure isn't a warning or a statement saying that the wall uh, would, vo would violate any zoning regulation. Um, exhibit seven and eight are from professional and licensed arborists and professional engineers with 20 years experience who state the, again, need for this wall, um, that it solves all the problems that were stated prior uh, and that there were practical practical difficulties that existed before the wall that made the wall necessary, uh, not elective. Uh, exhibits nine, uh, A, B, C, D, and E are all letters of support from the neighborhood. Uh, again, there isn't anyone in the area, including the immediate neighbors who want this wall removed or the patio removed. Uh, they're all in agreement that uh, it greatly improves the property and it greatly improves the surrounding neighborhood, which everyone is a favor of, uh, in favor of. Uh, in particular, I would like to point out uh, exhibit 9A, which is from the neighbor immediately across the alley who has the exact same retaining wall I do. Um, so again, 
my wall would fit in with uh, what already exists in the neighborhood. Um, he lived there for 25 years and he can speak uh, directly to the uh, problem of erosion being a significant issue at that property. Uh, he built his wall so that he could stop the erosion problems and maintain his property in a easy and uh, significant manner. Um, it would be uh, a property that would be unable to be maintained if the wall was not there. So again, a practical difficulty. And uh, lastly, exhibit 10 is a rough estimate showing the cost to remove the wall, which would, uh, and this evidence is unfair and unbearable financial burden that would result if this was not approved and we would have to remove the wall on the patio, um, which I don't believe is fair. So in closing, um, I tried to do everything I could to follow everything I needed to do uh, to make sure that I was not in violation of anything. I, I, I approached the city of Minneapolis. I told them what I wanted to do. I, I explicitly said, I'm going to build a retaining wall. What can I do? I would like to, uh, to put a privacy fence on top of the wall. Is that okay? Again, they didn't say anything. It took nearly two months to build the wall and I damn near promise you, they saw it building built. Sorry, they saw it being built. There's no way they could have not have seen it being built. So again, I asked them about it. They saw it be being built. They said nothing. And again, I hear 10 months after, oh, by the way, you have to tear the whole thing out, which again is completely unfair. So there isn't anyone who wants the wall out. There's no practical reason to take the wall out. It's not hurting anybody. It improves the property. And again, I would just highly appreciate if you would rule in my favor, please let us keep the wall and the patio. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Zilker. Are there any questions of the applicant? I do have one question of the applicant. Sure, Who, who's speaking? This is Jasmine. Oh, yes, Ms. Frias, go ahead. My question for the applicant is that you mentioned you spoke with city staff about uh, developing the wall there, and I'm wondering if you had similar conversations about the patio and the size and any materials you, any plans you had. Did you also talk with city staff about that? Well, again, uh, I didn't talk about uh, specific material being used. I don't. I don't think the material of the wall is the issue. Uh, no, of all. the patio. No, actually, uh, I did not tell them about the patio. Um, I guess uh, I was completely unaware that the uh, patio was not allowed in the front. Uh, I've, I've seen, again, uh, other patios like this in, in other places of um, Minneapolis. They're usually in the higher end areas, actually. So I don't see any anything like that around the areas where the house is, unfortunately. But um, again, I've, I've seen other patios in front yards, and I guess I, I didn't know it was not allowed. So. No, I did not ask him about the patio portion of the project. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zoker. Any thank other you. questions of the applicant? No. Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Thanks to the applicant, does a great presentation. Uh, question for you I have is, uh, obviously there was an amount of backfill needed to fill in the void or the slope differential once the wall was built. Where did that fill come from? On site, off site, front yard, backyard, against the house? Yes, sir. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, actually, I did tell that uh, specific detail in my longer version of, my, of, of the report, which I didn't go over uh, word by word. But yes, uh, there was no outside fill brought in to this property at all, except for a small amount of the black dirt that was, uh, you know, I had to have to put uh, the grass on. Uh, without the black dirt, obviously the grass and the side would not be able to be grown. Um, so um, aside from a few inches of the black dirt, um, any fill that was brought into even out the area from the flat part of the wall, sorry, the flat part of the yard to the new height of the retaining wall was all on site. So there was no on site uh, fill brought in. So one of the arguments that the city had that the wall was not allowed is because the quote unquote large amount of fill that had to be brought uh, on site, which is completely false. Again, there was no outside fill brought in to complete uh, the wall portion of the project. Okay. 
Uh, so in removing that soil from around or repurposing the soil, did it help create better drainage for your home and prevent drainage from your lot into the public right away that could cause a freezing issue on the sidewalk and a hazard oh, to the home? Oh, completely, absolutely. I mean, the wall has completely uh, resolved the ice issues that were, were, were there. Uh, prior to the wall, it would be impossible to keep the sidewalk free of ice no matter how much you were to shovel because of the hill there. Uh, all the ice would melt um, and then it would all seep onto the sidewalk. Uh, it's completely bare. It's completely safe sidewalk now. Um, the dirt that was used, uh, sorry, the small amount of fill that we had to use to fill in the section of the wall there was all taken from the backyard uh, where we uh, built a new uh, off street parking area, which um, also solved a lot of the uh, erosion and uh, drainage issues that were that were occurring in the backyard as well. Great. Um, are there any other questions? I don't hear any, so let's move on to. Uh, oh, Mr. Thanks. Johansson has one, it looks like. I have a question. Oh, Mr. Chair Perry. Yeah, go ahead. It, it seems like the wall's just a hair over four feet above grade, and it looks to me like if if one course of of the wall was removed, it wouldn't be in this position, and the the lot would slope, but it wouldn't be flat. Is that something you considered? Uh, no, not at all, because that was not uh, given as an option. You know, um, to be frank, and if I can interject something here, um, in dealing with the city of Minneapolis, it's been very black or white. Uh, anytime I've had a problem with them, I've also, I've I've offered them options that would be like a, um, you know, like a happy medium that would make them happy without having to tear everything out. They've been very obstinate in, 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 you know, offering any kind of uh, resolution that is not completely what they would want, which would be to tear the whole damn thing out. Um, if you can reference the professional survey, you will see the heights of the wall are on there clearly, and they are nowhere near four feet. Um, the highest measurement of the wall is actually 3.7, sorry, the highest point is actually in the front corner, uh, which is a 3.86 feet high. So uh, there is not any place on the wall that exceeds four feet. Um, it's actually averages closer to three and a half feet throughout the whole thing. So it's not anywhere close to, to four feet. It's actually closer to three and a half or closer to three in most uh, parts of the of the wall. Um, and again, it's, it's really crucial to understand that the natural grade per their own definitions, which is uh, 10 feet out from anywhere of the house uh, was completely undisturbed. So um, the house, sorry, the wall did not alter the natural grade per their own terms. So that's all I have to say about that. And I, I guess I have a follow up question then also. Um, th did you look at the, the city website to uh, review the information provided for retaining walls? Uh, they did not provide me any information. Uh, I built other smaller retaining walls in the past. Um, it was my understanding that anything under four feet uh, was not a problem that did not require a permit. Um, I've built other retaining walls in other front yards. Uh, and again, I've, I've never had this issue before. So um, again, uh, I talked to the zoning staff uh, specifically because again, I didn't want to have any problems. So I told them, hey, here's, 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 what, I would want to here's what I want to do, a wall under four feet high. Again, I was not told to review anything else or to look up anywhere on their uh, on their site about what I could not and could not build. I see, because there is a pretty clear um, information there. And I guess I, I'm referencing a photo I think the city provided that is a tape measure measuring from the sidewalk to the top of your wall. And it, it sure looks like it's four foot two to me. And I, I'm, not, I'm not getting how you're contesting that it's not over four feet. Because right. the Isn't professional that the, survey that I paid sixteen hundred dollars for by professional survey company indicates that it's clearly not under four feet. Um, I don't know how they're showing you that or where they measured from, but the wall in no way is over four feet anywhere. 
Huh. Well, that that seems to contradict this photo. Um, I, I guess I wish the photo showed the bottom of the tape at the sidewalk. Um, I, but I, I appreciate your uh, coming down and I, I thanks for answering my questions. No problem. Anything else I'm happy to answer. Okay, uh, Mr. Hutchins, did you have another question? Thanks, Chair Perry. I got one last question. I'll leave it alone. Uh, of the applicant, this, uh, can you speak to the quality of the previous existing wall, retaining wall that was there? Because this is a replacement of an existing wall, not a brand new build. How bad was it crumbling? Was it creating an issue in the public space? Things of that nature. Sure, yeah, sure. I appreciate the question. Um, I do want to be uh, completely honest. There was no retaining wall there initially. There was a couple of landscape timbers, which um, kind of averaged about one to three timbers high. Um, those timbers actually made it more difficult to mow and to maintain the property. Uh, the landscape timbers weren't doing anything to um, stop the erosion. They weren't doing anything to stop the ice melt onto the problem. Uh, sorry, on the, onto the sidewalks, which created a public hazard. The timbers that were there weren't doing anything to do anything that would help the property at all. So um, there was no like concrete retaining wall there at all. Uh, the what was there originally when I bought the house in 2009 was, like I said, a couple of old landscape timbers about one to three uh, in height. Okay, thanks for your answers. Appreciate it. No problem. Okay, let's move on to the next person, Angelina McDowell. You're also listed as an applicant. Um, you don't need to repeat anything that's already been said, but if you have some new material you'd like to share, please do so. You have to press star six to unmute your phone. Ms. McDowell, are you there? Let's move on to Judd Kilgore. Uh, hello. Yes, please, please uh, proceed. Yes, um, yeah, um, I'm, I will um, try to get a hold of uh, Mrs. McDowell. Um, I know that she would want to speak, so um, I will try to get a hold of her, and uh, hopefully she can uh, hop in here if she gets on in time. Do you want to give testimony? This is Blake Zockert. I'm I'm saying I I, I will. Oh. Try to contact Angelina. Um, and actually, she's calling me right now. I signed up last night and I'm waiting to be let onto the meeting. Uh, okay. I thought she was already in and was just uh, in the meeting earlier. Hello? Hello, who's this? Yeah, Angie just called me and told me that she's not able to unmute. She's pressing star six and it's not working for her. Her device might be <laughs> muted. Okay, um, yeah, let me, I'm trying to merge her call to your call here so you can hear her over my phone. Um, give me one sec while I tell her to make sure her device itself is not muted. I can switch it here. Not sure. Yeah. And it, sometimes when you unmute um, do the star six, it takes a minute for it to engage. Yeah, I'll tell her one second. Sorry. Is 
there a different phone number she might be able to call in to get reconnected? So, hmm. I really uh, like her testimony. She, uh, Hello, she used can to be anyone hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh. Okay, finally. I don't know what the heck was going on. I was pressing multiple times and then wouldn't um, unmute me. So, I am a neighbor of the property on 1400 uh, Gerard Avenue, and I just wanted to, um, you know, put in my two cents to, you know, hopefully, you know, you know, support Blake uh, keeping this retaining wall issue. So, um, a few things, you know, um, one, I hate for him to have to knock this wall over again. You know, aesthetically, it does look better in this, you know, on that property, but. I want to actually um, speak a bit more to the safety reasons of why I support this wall. Um, there have been a lot of car crashes over the years at the intersection of 14th Avenue and Gerard Avenue North that I've complained multiple times to the city about. And we've had cars, I've had like four cars end up in, in my yard over the years. And I felt like I've had to do defensive landscaping to keep cars, vehicles out of my yard uh, from, from these incidents. And so I look at the wall at Blake's and I'm like, that's actually pretty good defensive landscaping he's got there because um, on occasion he has had renters um, who have families and kids. And I feel like having that wall at that height in that yard I feel like if he has another family that rents to him or if anyone is just out sitting there in their yard and enjoying that yard, it's, it's going to make it a bit safer for them to not have to worry about a car crash and then blowing up and, you know, rolling into, you know, his front yard. Um, um, as far as like erosion, I, you know, I've seen it. I have it going on on my property across the street as well. Uh, pretty significant uh, sloping and, you know, uh, runoff from water, um, pooling, and then in the winter time with ice, you know, I see at Blake's property, that's no longer an issue for him, um, you know, as far as like upkeeping of the yard and then, you know, uh, freezing water, making it unsafe for uh, pedestrians in that area. And same even with littering, I know there's an area, um, back where uh, his garage is, or you know, not the garage, but you know, where there's parking. Um, before his tenants had a hard time parking, um, you know, with mud and everything in the backyard getting stuck. Um, and then where the bushes are, you know, there are people who would just like litter into the bushes and it was just like, you know, pretty disgusting and hard for him to keep up. And now with that wall there, it makes it a bit easier to upkeep and maintain a yard. And then of course there's um, less issues with like dirt running off and making it hard for his tenants to park there and, um, you know, not get stuck um, back there. But, you know, I guess overall I would hate, you know, for <laughs> the city after, you know, him seeing them seeing this get built, oh, you know, over the, you know, months that it took to get built for him to, um, you know, have to turn around and take that all out. I, I just think that's, you know, it's unsupportive for, you know, uh, landlords who are, you know, trying to, you know, maintain and, you know, um, you know, have, you know, maintain, a, you know, a good property here in Minneapolis. And, you know, I just, yeah. So that's what I got <laughs> as a neighbor. Okay. Thanks for your testimony. Is mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ms. Dawkins, do you want to step in to clarify something? Uh, only, only if this is the right moment. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, I, I think what we want to do is go through the public hearing and then give an opportunity for uh, board members to ask staff questions. I actually have some questions of you, so okay. I'm going to hold them off until we get through the public hearing part. Hello. Yes. I'm sorry, I forgot to to add around the like the patio issue because like I, I I was actually pretty thrown off as well about like that that being an issue. Um, 
to have in his front yard. And so I don't know if you are, are all aware of Old Highway neighborhood, but you know, there's a reason why I moved into this area is it's a pretty active neighborhood association and and I get to know a lot of my neighbors and I feel like that patio space is pretty welcoming and it encourages neighbors to interact with each other versus just sitting in their backyards. And so I guess I, I'm also just kind of like, what's, what's the big deal, you know? Uh, you know, and I feel like it brings, you know, contributes to having a sense of community, getting to know who your neighbors are, hanging out on your porch or your front yard. And so why not keep the patio space, I guess? I mean, we got enough problems here over north. I don't understand, like, why this is the thing, <laughs> you know, the patio thing. Because I feel like if this were in southeast or southwest, I wonder if this would even be an issue. So I'm I can, <laughs> I, I'll just, where, let me just say that the rules are applied equally throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And um, there are rule, there's reason for the rules. And I should also note that we're not a policy making body. We simply are trying to find where there is gray area in the code and what someone is trying to do based on the legal findings that we have to find for. So I appreciate your testimony. Is Judd Kilgore on the line? If you want to press star six to unmute your phone. Sir Judd Kilgore. Okay, perhaps he's not there. So I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, before we get going with staff questions, I actually have some. So we have this question of wall height, uh, Ms. Dawkins. And uh, what I am wondering is we have, what is the city going on? I mean, the applicant is saying, no, the wall is three and a half feet tall. Um, staff is saying not not so fast. It's actually four. Um, wh what do you go by? I mean, so, and he provided a survey that shows that apparently that the wall height does not exceed four feet or it comes close to four feet. So the issue we're really talking about is whether or not the retaining wall is a permitted obstruction in the front and side yard. And he, he did give us a survey and it does show that it's under four feet throughout. So staff accepted that as, as the survey. Um, and it, you know, it was provided by a licensed surveyor and stamped. So that, that is no longer, height of the wall is not necessarily the issue now. It's now whether it's allowed as a permitted obstruction because it's not retaining natural grade. The location of the wall, where it was placed on the yard, required the yard, the, the, the gap between the slope and the top of the wall to be backfilled. And that is not considered natural grade. If we had been asked specifically about the construction of this wall, which I was not, I was asked whether or not he could put a fence on top of a retaining wall, which he can if the if the retaining wall is legal. But if we had been asked about the specific design of the retaining wall, we would have told him to put it further back into the wall, into the yard, to cut into the natural grade to meet so that the so that the wall would have actually met natural grade without any gap. So and, and if you look at the permitted obstructions, it says very specifically retaining walls are permitted obstructions where natural grade is retained. In all cases, even if the wall had been over four feet, the only thing that would have been triggered is a building permit. He would have been required to get a building permit and we would have reviewed it, but we still would have allowed it if it was retaining natural grade. But in any case, if it's not retaining natural grade, then it's not a permitted obstruction. Okay, so I have a follow-up question on that uh, with natural grade um, and um, I, I should point out that I'm not questioning whether the process was followed or not, because that is not one of the legal findings. I mean, if the city 
messes up somehow in the process, that's an unfortunate um, outcome, but it is not, that doesn't fall into the legal findings that we have to ad address. So with natural grade, moving dirt around in the yard, it, that doesn't have anything to do with natural grade because he took it from the backyard and put it in the front yeah. yard. It, it doesn't. It, that's it, not a, So, So what, what the applicant is doing is he's conflating the way that we measure height from natural grade versus what natural grade actually is, right? So in a height measurement, we measure from the natural grade of the lot 10 feet in front of a structure. But that's not what we're talking about in this case. We're talking about whether or not the retaining wall is retaining natural grade, which means is the retaining wall meeting the top of the slope? And that's the requirement. The retaining wall has to meet the top of the slope. And if you have to, if there's a gap between the top of the slope and the retaining wall, it's not retaining natural grade. So that's what we use to determine whether or not the, it's a permitted obstruction. Okay, I um, I have another question, but I think Mr. Softley has a question, so I want to give him an opportunity to ask. Go ahead, Mr. Softley. Thank you, Chair Perry. Uh, Ms. Dawkins, I'm wondering if you can help explain then how an applicant is supposed to know which, when to not use the natural grade definition for building height and, and, and how, um, let me rephrase that. Given that there's two different uses for natural grade, one of which appears to be defined in the code and used for calculating building height, how is an applicant supposed to know that that definition is inapplicable to retaining walls? Mostly because it's about measuring the height of building structures. So I, this has never been an issue that's come up because retaining walls, we, we always give the advice that or the information that the code says that it has to be retaining natural grade and we don't I I I I don't have a perfect answer for that but it's never been an issue when we talk about what natural grade means um and Mr El Mr Ellis seems to have an answer as well so Mr Ellis uh Chip Perry members of the board I think I think the the best way to maybe answer it is that the the definition of height so how we measure height um, so both of them are in our definitions chapter. So we define natural grade and what natural grade is. Um, I believe that's in the report. Um, and then we also have a definition of height. So how we, it's height uh, of, of a structure. So when we measure a structure that we're referencing natural grade. So that, that definition references a different um, you know, definition. So what we're trying to say is um, we measure the height of a structure based on the the grade as it exists and so that is essentially natural grade and so that kind of gets thrown out in this sense normally like if we're talking about just a retaining wall um that has nothing to do with our measurement of height because that's really just used for garages sheds and 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 you know houses etc and really the na natural grade that its simplest thing is just the grade as it exists on site pr on site prior to any modification by um, a person or, or an owner or whoever it might be. Um, that's probably the simplest way to put it. Um, and then, you know, the, when then the definition, so when we're measuring a building, if somebody's going to do new construction, we are going to take our measurement based on the way the grade is on the site prior to that construction. So that's the way it works. Because we do have natural grade and then we have other references for how we measure things that would be post-construction grade. So essentially not natural grade. So we do have a definition of grade and we have a definition of natural grade, um, which can conflate it a little bit more. But basically that's what the the whole point of the retaining wall regulations are to uh, have it, re like if you're going to be a permitted obstruction, has to retain existing grade, basically no grade modification. And if it's going to modify it, in a required yard, then a variance is required. So I hope that explained it. It, it does help. I, I guess I'm still wondering how an applicant is supposed to know the difference between the technical definition and then the common sense definition um, and when, when either one is applicable. Um, and I guess as a comment, I'll say we actually see quite a lot of these applications that come before the board because someone has backfilled um, a retaining wall. So I, I think it is an issue that comes up a lot because there seems to be a lot of confusion uh, from from applicants, from owners, from builders about about what should be done. And I, I'm not throwing blame in anyone's direction. If anything, the applicants are responsible to know the requirements. 
but there seems to be a lot of confusion on this issue. And I would and I would say too that some of the issue stems from the fact that that was an ordinance change from a little over a decade ago that in the past you would be able to do this as of right. This is something that would have been allowed, say, in 2005. And, and I think that causes additional confusion because people will point maybe across the street to a neighbor and say, why can't I do what they did? And it is due to the regulatory change. And it, it is one of the more difficult aspects to explain on a regular basis. So. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Ellis. That's actually a really helpful explanation for why the challenge exists. Thank you. Are there other questions of staff? Is there any board comment or any motions? And what I'm going to suggest um, is that we take these motions, uh, that uh, we take these variances one at a time, the patio and the retaining wall. Ms. Frias? Yeah, thank you, Chair Perry. I have, I was going to suggest yeah, that we, I was going to suggest that we for the recommendation to deny for the fence, I would oppose that because I feel like this is actually safer for not only the tenants that are going to live here, but also people using the sidewalk as opposed to its previous um, state as I'm looking at the pictures. But I am interested to hear also if anyone, if any of the other board members had comments about the patio since we haven't discussed that yet. So um, great, uh, we should definitely discuss that. I will just say, Ms. Frias, one of the things that um, would be required um, for any motion to um, not adopt staff finding and grant the variance as requested would be, you'd have to find for uniqueness of the property and for reasonable use. Um, uh, which staff could not find for either variance. So, um, Mr. Hutchins, you have a motion on the patio. Thanks, Chair Perry. If I may, I would uh, move staff findings uh, on the patio to deny the variance request. I feel like they totally hit the nail on the head with those ones. I don't see any reason to change any of the findings on that one. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? A second, this is Sandberg. It's seconded. And is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board member Finlayson. He's abstaining. Oh, that's right. Uh, recused. He's abstained. Thank you very much. He's recusing. Uh, for, yes, recusing. Thank you. Um, Board member Frias. Aye. Board member Hutchins. Aye. Board member Johannesson. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. Board member Softly. Aye. Board member Smikarova. Aye. Board member Wang. Aye. That's seven yeas and one abstention or one recusal. So that motion passes and uh, staff recommendation to deny the variance is in, is passed. So now we move on to allowing a retaining wall not obstructing natural grade in the required front yard and corner side yards. Um, as I said, um, if someone's going to make a motion other than okay. to adopt, I'm sorry. Um, if someone's going to make a motion that is other than to adopt staff findings, then we'll need to have them uh, to provide um, findings for finding one, finding two, uniqueness and reasonable use. Or is there any further discussion on the uh, obstruction, the uh, having the retaining wall in the place that it is at. Where it's not retaining natural grade. Uh, Mr. Sandberg and then Mr. Hutchins. Natural grade. 
Um, yeah, thank you, Chair Perry. I guess we could consider a unique characteristic of the property, the fact that um, the intersection is subject to traffic problems that uh, could impinge on the yard and that uh, um, a uh, more substantial retaining wall than existed there with natural grade would uh, protect the property and the residents from those situations. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hutchins, did you have a comment? Thanks, Chair Perry. I'll, uh, I'll take a stumbling attempt through findings and see if staff gives me the go ahead on them, I suppose. Uh, under the first one, practical difficulties, I'll just cite that the uh, erosion issue was major on the project because the increased slopage, the existing retaining wall timbers are not uh, posed a risk to the health of the community. So then that creates a practical difficulty to have to solve the issue. Uh, to piggyback on Mr. Sandberg's comments, the uh, intersection being prone to accidents uh, would preclude the, the ability of cutting back the slope because then it would just increase the ramp up speed for a crash into the yard, which actually puts the crash closer to the home and the family living in it or the renters living in it. And then my second finding, I would uh, health and safety. I would say maybe just the health and safety because it is a corner lot. There is a lot of sidewalk and ADA compliance for uh, wheelchairs, the elderly children, things of that nature, and a pooling of water created by the old existing grade slopage towards the street will become a health and safety issue. And by this wall existing, it solves that issue. So I think I think staff found for the third finding the health and safety. What's so I think a reasonable missed? use. I think it's it, a reasonable it, use to want to uh, protect your value yeah. in your home and your. Uh, I'm gonna come back to that one if I have to. Okay, Mr. Johannesson. Yeah, do you have a comment? Very. I just I support staff findings here, and I I think that the wall could have been built in a different different location and and meet the the code. Okay. Thanks for that comment. Um, I'd like to ask staff if they feel that reasonable use, as Mr. Hutchins has has laid it out, is sufficient for uh, us to be uh, to that is legally sufficient. Uh, I would think that it's legally sufficient to say that the erosion if if the board finds the erosion issue to be compelling, then I think it's legally justifiable to allow the retaining wall to remain for reasonable use for oh for reasonable use. Um, if if the reason of if i mean possibly i don't know i i'm i i don't know that the it's it's a reasonable use of the property to want to protect the slopes from eroding into the sidewalk which i which was pointed out as an issue by the applicant and the neighbors in their comments so it is reasonable to want to protect the slope of the yard from crumbling into the public right of way. Okay. Just want to make sure that the motion is uh, is in order and that we have ourselves covered. Um, so there has been a motion. Did you make a motion, M Mr. Hutchins? No, but I will. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, grant uh the wall staying uh variance a under the previous things i've said all the findings i said and i would piggyback on top of a reasonable use of the property um, using the retaining wall to retain the trees if we need some more meat on the bones on number two and i'd uh move that forward is there a second Freya seconds is the motion is there any further discussion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Frias. Aye. 
Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johanneson. Nay. Member Sandberg. Aye. Board Member Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Nay. Board Member Wang. Nay. That's four yeas and three nays and one recusal. Okay. So that motion passes and the uh, that variance request is approved. Let's move on to um, item number nine. Ms. Smith. Hello, good evening, Chair Perry and board members. It's nice to see you all again. Um, and this is for 3030 Nicolet. I'll just wait for the first slide to come up and I'll begin. So for item number nine, please. Thank you. So 3030 Nicollet Avenue. Um, this application is for, uh, next slide please. This application is um, for 3030 Nicollet Avenue, which is located just to the south of Lake Street. It's located in the C3 Gas Community Shopping Center District, uh, as well as the PO Pedestrian Oriented Overlay District and the Transit 15 Built Form Overlay District. Next slide please. So the question at hand today is, is the rebuttal of abandonment of the drive through that was on the property um, uh, from between 1971 and May of 2020. Staff has evidence that through the that the drive through which uh, was a legal non conforming use has ceased to operate for more than a year between May 2020 and May of 2021 and it may, may not be reestablished as a result. Um, per section 53140 of the zoning code, the applicant may rebut the abandon presumption of abandonment by presenting clear and convincing evidence that the discontinuance was beyond the property owner's control. Next slide, please. So here you can see the drive through facility that existed on the site up until May 2020 and the permit that established that drive through facility in 1971. Um, so because of the um, zoning code change in 2019 that prohibited the establishment of new drive through uses, this existing drive through became a legal non conforming use in 2019. Um, next slide, please. So these are photos provided by the applicant. Um, in May 2020, as a result of the civil unrest, the drive through facility and bank building were destroyed and um, it has not been in operation since then. Um, because the traditional drive through facility has ceased to function for over one year, the use is presumed abandoned by the zoning code definition. And uh, Next slide, please. So here's a site plan that has been submitted by the applicant. Um, the applicant communicated an intent to reestablish the former bank with a drive through facility at the property. Um, they, they proposed this to planning staff approximately six months after the destruction of the drive through. And they submitted a land use application for a mixed use development that includes a new drive through facility on May 27, 2021. Planning staff uh, deemed the application incomplete on June 17, 2021. Uh, Wells Fargo, which is the applicant, hired an architect and developer through an RFP process by the end of 2020. Wells Fargo has submitted numerous grant applications to various entities beginning in spring 2021, which demonstrates their intent to redevelop the site as a mixed use building, including the drive through use. They, they plan to do this um, instead of rebuilding the drive through facility as it was originally designed prior to its de destruction. Next slide, please. These are additional photos provided by the applicant. And so you can see this is perhaps the most important piece of evidence um, for this particular application. 
um, that these photos show a temporary drive through ATM that Wells Fargo has continuously been operating since the destruction of the original facility. Staff has concluded that the applicant has not in fact ceased the drive through operations at this property. Next slide, please. So uh, in conclusion, staff finds that the applicant has submitted evidence that the destruction of the drive through facility was beyond their control. The photographic evidence provided as part of this certificate of non-conforming use application shows that the applicant has not, not ceased um, drive through operations at this property. Uh, the continued cessation of the full drive through facility for more than one year was outside of the applicant's control due to the length of the grant application process for the proposed redevelopment, as well as the need for substantial public outreach. CPED is recommending that the Zoning Board of Adjustment approve the application for a certificate of non-conforming use to, re to rebut the abandonment presumption of abandonment of a non-conforming drive through facility. And I'm here to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation, Ms. Smith. Are there any questions of staff? Mr. Sandberg? Yeah, thank you, Chair Perry and uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, the reason I pulled this was I, I read a uh, public comment that was submitted in writing just before the meeting, and that person brought up um, a, re a perceived requirement that a building permit be applied for within 120 days of the destruction of a structure on a property that had non-conforming rights. Um, my concern was just that staff had considered that requirement and that it isn't subject to being reinterpreted uh, after the fact by someone who objects to um, the staff recommendations. Um, well, the the provision is a separate section of the code that provides a path forward to rebuilding a legal non-conforming structure um, or, or a structure with a legal non-conforming use after it's destroyed or damaged. Um, it, the provision specifically says that it can't be enlarged. It has to be approved exactly as it is. And so it's a, it's a path forward to getting, um, so if that drive-through facility wanted to be rebuilt exactly as is, we would have to approve that if we received a permit within 180 days. Um, so this th that doesn't preempt the fact, the ability for the the applicant now to um, establish their legal non-conforming rights and uh, and rebut the abandonment of the drive-through because it um, because of the evidence that it hasn't been in use for more than a year. And we've consistently applied non-conforming uses in the same manner, regardless of the type um, of use, whether they're a drive through or not. And so this is a process that we use to accommodate state law and this the, the discontinuance provision that we're um, analyzing and evalu evaluating today um, is, is just consistent with how we have been handling this. And, uh, and it's a, a, a little bit of a separate process. Okay, thank you. That was my only concern. Thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Smith? I don't hear any, so let's open the public hearing. Um, we have um, the uh, applicant, uh, a member of the applicant team, Bob Butterbolt Brot. Uh, are you on the line? If you could press star six, you don't have to give testimony, but you can if you want. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Chair Perry and members of the board, my name is Bob Butterbrot, and I am a senior vice president with the Public Affairs Group at Wells Fargo based here in Minneapolis. I want to thank you for your time tonight and service to the city. Um, I, I just I'll offer a couple comments here and uh, turn it over to my partners from uh, Design by Mellow and PPL uh, to um, further the presentation. Um, but I just want to um, stress here that I've been working with leaders from across Wells Fargo on our transformation effort at the site since uh, May 28th of 2020. And uh, I'm here today and speak 
to speak in support of the project. Um, following the fire, uh, and I think we've tried to make this uh, clear in the staff report as well, uh, but following the fire and throughout the changes that have taken place on that site, Wells Fargo has maintained our drive-through for the standalone ATM on the property. And in fact, has continued to use the site in various configurations uh, to serve our customers after the main building was damaged. Uh, some of those measures include constructing temporary access to our vault uh, so that our customers could retrieve safe deposit boxes, providing temporary offices on the site for the safe transfer of those contents, um, and then bringing in that mobile ATM, uh, the mobile ATMs that we've had on site to increase uh, or to meet the increased demand that we've seen at this location. Um, and I will point out that all of this has taken place during a pandemic when we've seen many customers rely even more so on drive through ATMs to conduct their transactions while maintaining social distance. Um, against the backdrop of this scramble to provide for continued service to our customers, we issued an RFP for the site that spelled out our intent to not only rebuild, but to involve the community in visioning and designing what else could take place on the site. And it was the, uh, the result of that RFP was the selection of PPL and the Cultural Wellness Center and uh, through them uh, designed by Mello, uh, who have been driving that community um, engagement uh, in terms of uh, putting forth that vision that I think you'll see uh, once Damaris takes over. So at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Damaris Hollingsworth from Designed by Mello um, so she can walk through some of the site plan provisions with you. All right, uh, are there any questions of uh, Mr. Butterbrot? Hi. Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Um, I, I'm just, excuse me, is, is this Ms. Hollingsworth? This is the Maris. Yeah, this is the Maris Hollingsworth. Could you hold up for a minute? Sure. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any questions of Mr. Butterbrot from the board. I don't hear any, so please proceed. And Thank if you, you could, uh, if you could um, speak to the, uh, I think we appreciate the project, but if you could speak to the uh, uh, rebuttal of uh, non loss of non-conforming rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. So uh, my name is Damaris Hollingsworth. I'm the architect leading this uh, this project. Uh, so just to a little bit on the process and the reasons why we are just now okay, starting really being ready for a full complete a complete application is because of the process really that the Wells Fargo had chose uh, after the fire they chose to take the route of building better uh, and then therefore they looked for a partner like PPL that are focused on community development and in partnership with the cultural the center um, to really have a project here that was much different from many things that have been built in, in the town in town so from there we went to a very um robust community engagement meetings we had six meetings for community input uh and then three more meetings that we went back uh, reporting back to the community uh checking that we heard correctly and then a final presentation with the design which is being proposed uh this powerpoint that is i was producing the screen um shows our uh final design proposition and really we have been in this uh, very um, extensive timeline, but really because we wanted to do the right thing here. And we had amazing input from the community in the proposition of a, de a design that really responds to that, uh, really well accepted by the community at our last meeting. The timeline, uh, Faith Human is going to speak to you more closely, but we really had, uh, Wells Fargo had an option to resubmit a same building drawings for permits uh, within the 180 days, yes, but then uh, the choice of doing rebuilding better with community input and a solution that would actually meet the community um, aspirations, as you can see in some of the slides, um, was a choice made. And th therefore, here, here we are today with uh, trying to, to defend the project and defend this, the, re the rebuilding of the drive through but in a much better manner. If you look at the site plan that was shared already by Maylene, 
So my, the video on my end is like about two, three minutes behind my speech. So I am just talking to, to whatever. I don't know what you guys can see. What I can see is very different. Uh, it's really delayed, I think, by two, three minutes. So um, the site plan that I'm proposing really hides the, the, the drive through uh, quite a, uh, before the, it was a very clear view from Nicolette of all the lanes. And now we are really hiding it and wrapping it with uh, vegetation, with, some, with even the building. So the, the public realm experience is not compromised by, um, by the, by the drive through Also with the city staff guidance, we end up with just one access to the site on 31st. Therefore, again, really creating a better experience for pedestrians outside the site and in the site. So there's no all cross circulation in the site but with cars. So we created a pocket park that is a public park, not a resident community. May, I, I'm sorry and for inter I'm sorry for interrupting you. We don't really mm -hmm. need to hear about the quality of the project. Okay. We, okay. We, we, we accept that the quality of the project is a good one. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it is more about the timeline about mm -hmm. the use. So if you have anything to add about that, that's what's important to our decision making. So we acknowledge that the city acknowledges the project is a good one and that the design is well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, I think that um, Faith Kimon is going to uh, chime in from PPL with the timeline uh, that has, we even have an image for that. It shows up eventually here. With okay. that so you guys can see exactly what the time was taking for even for land use application, building permits, and the funding application, of course, for a project of this, this size. Uh, being affordable housing at the levels that they are. So Faith, I think I'll take, you can take from here. Yes, uh, Ms. Kuman, if you want to talk about the timeline as it re re relates to the rebuttal of uh, non-conforming use, the loss of non-conforming use. You'll need to press star six to unmute your phone. Is Ms. Faith Kuman on the line? Hello? Hello? I think we're going to have to proceed without her. Um, so let's close the public hearing. Um, any board comment? Or a motion? Mr. Johannesson? Thanks, Chair Perry. I make a motion to adopt staff findings. Okay, is there a second? Second, second Sandberg. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Board Member Frias. Aye. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johannesson. Aye. Board Member Sandberg. Aye. Board Member Softly. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Aye. Board Member Wang. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. So that motion passes and the uh, the uh, application is approved as as requested. So with that, we will move on and I think we've completed all of our items on the agenda for this meeting. 
unless somebody has any new or old business they'd like to bring up. I don't hear any. So hearing none and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Our next meeting will be March 3rd, 2022. As Mr. Ellis said, we do not have a meeting on March 17th. Our next meeting is March 3rd, 2022. Thank you, everyone.